Ignite to Impact. Hi, this is Dr. Geneva. Welcome to Ignite to Impact, a podcast to inform and inspire positive meaning change within ourselves and in others. So I'm your host, Dr. Geneva. You know I'm a leadership coach, a strategist, and now a best-selling author. So I want you to hurry on to Amazon and uh, look me up, Geneva Williams, and you'll see all my books there. Uh, Please, if you get one and read it, Give me a review. I'd love to hear from you. Love to hear what you think about. And on this podcast, we, you know, we look at influence and impact. And, you know, using your influence for positive change can be one of the most rewarding experiences of your life. And, you know, I like to share strategies in conversation with people or just me rapping by myself on how to create extraordinary impact in organizations, within the community, and in your everyday life. So whether you want better results in your life, career or community, um, want you to know or just want to hear some good old advice about uh, what people are doing or just want to be inspired to uh, make good things happen. This Ignite to Impact podcast is for you. So right now we're in the uh, season, uh, February of Black History Month, and it's the time when folks stop and reflect on the contributions that African Americans have made in this country and around the world. Now, I'm a believer that uh, we need to stop and recognize the contributions that folk make all year round, 365 days a year. But since this is the month of doing that, I said, well, you know what? I want to talk about leadership and impact and the kinds of things we talk about on this podcast frequently, but I wanted to focus it around leadership lessons and the lessons that um, I've learned and want to share with you, particularly the leadership lessons around impact leadership. And I define impact leadership as that um influence that really makes a difference in the community and in your own life and in the lives of others. And I believe that impact leaders create change in the status quo. So an effective leader, I believe, encourages and welcomes change because all progress requires a positive change in the status quo. Good leaders challenge the process and embrace opportunities to improve. That's when growth occurs. It really does. Growth occurs in change. And that's when you experience success, when you're willing to step out into the unknown outside of your comfort zone. Now, although the way forward may seem obvious to a leader and may even look easiest to achieve, All too often, any new initiative will be met with resistance, if not outright hostility. So a good leader must be prepared to sidestep chaos, run around or jump over obstacles, and defeat direct opposition to achieve a goal. As you push for a solution to a tough problem or unacceptable circumstance, It's a good idea to remember what the 19th century abolitionist and orator Frederick Douglass told us about taking on the status quo and the powers that be. If there's no struggle, there is no progress, Douglass said. Those who profess to favor freedom and yet deprecate agitation are men who want crops without plowing up the ground They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the awful roar of its many waters. Frederick Douglass went on to add, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. 
More than 50 years after President Lyndon B. Johnson announced the creation of the Federal Head Start program in May of 1965, it's hard to imagine that the community-based child development initiative was once controversial, opposed by local leaders who viewed it as a useless social engineering and a wasteful example of increased federal influence in America's cities and towns. Since 1965, Head Start has served more than 36 million children, giving them a strong foundation for their educational, social, and physical growth. In my hometown of Neptune, New Jersey, my father, Ermin Jones, fought to bring Head Start to the city's black community as soon as it was introduced. After all, Head Start was designed to strengthen the education, health, and social development of preschool children from low-income families. Kids learned about reading and other school subjects, ate nutritious food, and played with other children at Head Start. Bringing Head Start to Neptune was one of the many fights my dad undertook on behalf of Neptune's black community a minority group that was openly opposed by the city's leaders and major institutions. As education chairman for the local NAACP, which represented Neptune and Asbury Park as its next door neighbor. So on the Jersey Shore, these small towns were right next to each other. So Neptune was right next to Asbury Park. And so the NAACP there was an organization that represented both of those um, uh, small uh, towns. Um, So my dad, uh, as education chairman of that NAACP, joined forces with another community group called the Neptune Neighborhood Council. And so all of you know, I'm giving you some of this background because some it, it's a lot of it, most of it is in the book that my dad and I wrote about all of this um, transformation and civil rights history that was going on in these small communities that a lot of times you don't talk about or know about, but there were so many unsung heroes that every single day were creating change. And so um, these are lessons, again, that, that I'm pulling from the work that he and I did in a book called Justice on the Jersey Shore. So there were many meetings that were attended uh, to work and fight to bring Head Start into the community. And so the NAACP attended meetings of the Neptune Board of Education and asked for permission to use the city school buildings to launch the local Head Start program. Now, this was in the summer of 1965. Clearly, the schools were empty and had no other use during that time. But the Board of Education turned it down, arguing that the schools were for school only. Dad told me that a primary fear of theirs of theirs was that Head Start would be beneficial to black children only, although the program was clearly open to all children. Turning things up a notch, my father and the others attended a special meeting on the subject at the Board of Education headquarters. They were told no again they began to protest on the spot. That's when the authorities ended the meeting and put them out. Finally, my father and the neighborhood council identified one particular school in Neptune's predominantly black neighborhood as an ideal location. The group went to a public meeting of the county government, which was formerly known as the chosen freeholders of Monmouth County. County leaders were called the freeholders by local residents back then. Well, the freeholders gave the Head Start supporters the same answer as the Board of Education gave them. No, you can't use our school buildings for the Head Start program. So the group protested again. My dad and others came prepared with their signs, and the demonstrators definitely got everyone's attention. 
Shortly thereafter, with a lot of press and a lot of media, the freeholders ruled that the local schools could be used for Head Start that summer and that a county agency would run the program. My dad, representing the NAACP, signed the agreement with the Neighborhood Council, the school system, on June the 4th, 1965, essentially one month after the Head Start was announced nationally. Opening school doors to a new preschool program for the summer was a simple thing, but it was strongly opposed by powerful city leaders. Yet my father was not afraid to speak up and say, let's make a change and do something different for the good of everyone. That's leadership. And it's definitely one of the leadership lessons in our book, Justice on the Jersey Shore. The late Toni Morrison, famous author of Beloved, Song of Solomon, The Bluest Eye, and other novels, was awarded the 1993 Nobel Prize for Literature, the first black woman woman to win it, and one of the only 11 American writers. In her Nobel Prize acceptance lecture, Ms. Morrison used a parable to make the point that we all have the power to make significant change. She described an old woman who was wise but blind. The woman was approached by a group of children who probably wanted to trick her or tease her. They asked her to tell them whether a small bird one of them held was dead or alive. Now remember, the old woman was wise but blind. But understanding that they probably just wanted to have fun at her expense, she answered, I don't know whether the bird is dead or alive, but what I do know, that it is in your hand. It is in your hand. Toni Morrison suggested two different interpretations of this parable. One of them was that it tells us we can decide at all times whether to do and say the right thing or do and say the wrong thing. Because she was a great novelist and her lifelong domain was the world of words, Miss Morrison proceeded to talk about taking action with language, that in fact it's the language that is used and that has power and influence. And language can be used to control and abuse people as a tool of evil that leads to conformity, control, and death, or language that celebrates freedom and the diversity of human culture can point the way to creativity that produces worlds of good. The lesson she shared about language can be applied to taking the initiative for a positive outcome in any field, in education, in business, in science, in politics, in government, or in the arts. She made the same point years earlier when she made this famous statement. If there's a book that you want to read, but it hasn't been written yet, then you must write it. (laughs) And yes, that's because an impact leader takes the initiative to create change, to create that change in the status quo. So here we come to the end of another lesson, one of the leadership lessons from Justice on the Jersey Shore, the book that I wrote with my dad, and I hope you'll go and and get it and read it and tell me what you think about it. But I just thought it was important, particularly during this time of Black History Month. And as you know, on this podcast, we always talk about impact, creating change, creating change in the community, in ourselves, with others in everyday life. I thought it was important to bring forth some of the lessons, the leadership lessons about making a difference that were just um, so such an important part of the things that I learned and 
what I um, experienced as I wrote Justice on the Jersey Shore. So this is Dr. Geneva. Uh, Please um, let me know what you think about this podcast. Download it. Give me a rating. Uh, Tell your friends about it. Subscribe. As you know, I'm on iHeartRadio, on Apple Podcasts, on most social media platforms. Uh, Tell your friends about it. Um, Also, come on over to Facebook and and, uh, join me in Extraordinary Women Influencers, my Facebook group. I'd love to see you. And I want to also give you a heads up. I'm going to be talking soon about a new feature that I'm going to be adding to Ignite Impact. Uh, I'll be talking about it later soon. But for right now, this is Dr. Geneva saying thank you for listening to Ignite to Impact. Ignite to Impact.